Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Bridging forward this is our last message about building bridges and we're going to do a little commissioning time together later on where I'm going to send you guys out under the power of God and the Holy Spirit, and we're gonna sing a song as a, as a prayer. So I'm actually gonna just have the worship team hang out here. Thank God for an awesome worship team. Thank God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm gonna share my heart as well as, you know, I'm leading, us, I'm leading us through a year I've never ever had to deal with. My first election year is, uh, <laughs> maybe it's my last, <laughs> no, I should. Just trying to get through it. But one thing that God's kept me focused on throughout this entire 2020, even before I even thought about elections earlier in the year, was mission. His mission on earth. Because this is just the beginning of life. There's life everlasting that we have to think about, think eternally. In the scripture that we have, as we wrap up the Building Bridges series, you know, building relationships with those in our community who need Jesus, the last one I want to talk about is bridging forward. We need to move forward. No matter what takes place, church, this week, do not forget the lost. In fact, like I said, this world is waking up to the need for Jesus even more. So let's be ready. And so Matthew 9, if you have your Bible, go to Matthew 9. We'll have it on the screen as well for everyone online or in here in the church. Matthew 9, verse 35, it says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. It was his kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Kind of sounds like our world right now, doesn't it? We need God as our leader. And people are lost and, and helpless and hurting. And something God whispered to me today as I was praying and worshiping the first service, how does, how does the church have that same burden for the lost and those who are hurting? How do we get that? Well, it's interesting. Jesus was in the proximity of lost or hurting people. He could see them. And when you get around hurting people, your heart starts to break for them. Not judge them, not condemn them, but break for them. See, Jesus' heart hurt. His, his, actually, the Greek word here, which I won't try to even pronounce because I don't want to embarrass myself, but th the New Testament was mostly written in Greek, and they would use words, and it had a meaning to it. And the meaning here for compassion, when Jesus had compassion, it meant a, a feeling of love and concern from his bowels, from the depths of his gut, just a gut-wrenching compassion for those around. So in other words, he was hurting big time for these people. Today, we might say that from the depths of our heart, we're hurting, but even sometimes my stomach has hurt. When I'm around those in our community, my heart burdens and breaks for them. My stomach does. That's God. It's hard to feel that way if we're not around the law. So this entire series, I've been encouraging us to be around people so that your increase for compassion that the people that need Jesus, your increase, your passion would increase for them. But the word compassion here has something else to do with it. It, it says this, when I, from my study on this, is that compassion leads to action. It's, 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 it's okay to, to feel a certain way, but the, the compassion that Jesus had was it pushed him to do something about it. In church, when you get around those and, and God opens your eyes to see what they're going through. When God breaks your heart, you're going to want to do something about it. Amen. Love them, pray for them, serve them, do some act of kindness. So that's the heart of today's message. He goes on to say, though, in the next verse, these people that are lost, these people that are helpless, confused, need guidance. It says the harvest is great, but the workers are few. What's the harvest? It's the people ready for salvation. It's the people that God has ready for salvation. The harvest is ready. There's so many people lost to confuse and even more so now. There's so many people who need guidance and truth, who need love and compassion right now. 
The harvest is ready, but guess what isn't ready? The laborers, the workers. Look what it says here. It says, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So he says this, pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. It doesn't say send more pastors. It doesn't say send more worship leaders. It doesn't say send more Bible scholars. It says workers. That's you and I. That's all of us. We can work the fields that God has. And here's the thing. You know what's so encouraging about this? Because a lot of times we'll be like, hey, I can't do that. Guess guess whose field it is. What is What does the scripture say? Right there. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Amen. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, we heard. Ask the Lord of the harvest. Whose field is it? Whose harvest is it? It's God's. In other words, he's in charge. He's in charge of the great harvest of people. And he's, he's like, it's time to now come into my fields and do the work of bringing people in. They, the harvesters would harvest the grain and they would put it into the barn. And in other words, he's, Jesus is saying here, go and gather the lost. Go and gather the helpless. Go and show compassion to them and bring them to Jesus. I'm ready to bring them in. They're ready. We just need more workers to do that. And he says, pray that God would send workers into the field. So what's going to happen when we pray later? We're actually praying about ourselves too. When we say, I'm going to pray for people to go in the field, we're also saying, I'm going to go do it. And I've given you six messages, and there's so much more. There's so much more, and I'll continue to train our church on how to do this. There's so much more to do. But six messages already on how to build bridges, how to go bring people in. And you can always see those again on the website. Church, I want you to know that we must adapt. There's a paradigm shift that's going to take place in this church. It already has been happening. Even before you guys elected me as your lead pastor a little over a year ago, it was already happening because this is pastor's heart too, Pastor Coons. But God messed me up recently, and, and he's been showing me this for years, and he reminded me from a book I'm reading called Canoeing the Mountains. And it has to do with, it's crazy. It was written in 2015, but it seems like it was written this year. And basically the book is, we're going into unknown territory we've never faced before. What do we do as a church? What do we do? And this is what these two pastors, this is a story from the book I want to read to you. One night after a long day of meetings, an older pastor let out a heavy sigh. He was near in retirement and we were working together on a project that was supposed to reorganize our entire denomination in order to help our church better minister in a changing world. And that changing world weighed on him. He remembered well how not that long ago life was different. He said to me, and this is interesting, I never thought of this because I'm 36, okay, so this used to be like this. You know, when I began my ministry in a church in Alabama, I never worried about church growth or worship attendance or evangelism, which means to go out and tell about Jesus. Back then, this is crazy. Back then, if a man didn't come to church on Sunday, his boss asked him about it at work on Monday. That's how Christian it was back then. Sociologists and uh, theologians refer to this recently passed period as Christendom. The 1700 year long era with Christianity at the privileged center of Western cultural life. In other words, Christianity was the dominating culture of life in America. Christendom gave us the Ten Commandments in schools. It gave us under God and the Pledge of Allegiance and exhortations to Bible reading in the national newspapers. Newspapers. He actually has a copy from 1963 where the Los Angeles Times was encouraging people to read the Bible. Imagine that happening today. That's how Christian our nation was. It was the day when every city laid out the town square with the courthouse, the library, and the first church of whatever known city. They organized the city around a church, a courthouse, and a library, and sometimes schools. For most of us, these days are long gone. This is, a, this is a meeting together with two pastors and they're realizing how much America has changed and how it's affecting their churches. 
when cities are now considering using eminent domain laws to replace churches with tax revenue generating big box stores. Now that's going away, isn't it? Now big box stores are closing up, isn't it? But the church, well, churches are closing up too, unfortunately. COVID has taken out some churches. But God, his church will prevail. This church will prevail. Goes on to say this. When Sundays are more about soccer and Starbucks than the Sabbath, when Christian student groups are getting de-recognized on university campuses, when the fastest growing religious affiliation among young adults is none, they don't have one, when there is no moral consensus built on Christian tradition, even among Christians, when even a funeral, and he's not bashing this, he's just saying that this is how different cultures change, when a conservative beach town is more likely to be a Hawaiian style paddle out than a gathering in a sanctuary, then Christendom as a marker of society has clearly passed. We are heading into uncharted territory and are given the charge to lead a mission where the future is nothing like the past. Church, when I read this, I was like, yeah, I know. I had a, a crisis moment one day as a 36 year old. I had to realize that we can't be the church we used to be. Our message will always stay the same. The truth of God will never change, but our methods have to adjust. We have to walk out of this building and go to people since they're not really coming here. And what a challenge in, it, in church, I'm up for this challenge. I'm up for this challenge to, to be a church that changes uh, its ways of working and functioning. And we have already been forced to because of COVID. We are online more than I've ever been and ever will be at church. We're, we're gonna continue to grow our online presence. I've never thought we would be in this day. And I wanna do an apology real quick to our online uh, congregation. Did you know we have two churches now? We have a church in here and we have a church online. Praise God, it's awesome. It's awesome. I need to apologize to you all because our connection has been bad recently. In the middle of service last week, it dropped out and it was buffering and I apologize. And our tech team figured out, are you ready for this? I don't wanna talk about money, but I need to talk about money because it takes money to run two churches online and in here. But here's the deal. We found out we need a server. Uh, a per, I, they used all the tech words. I don't know what they are. We need a server that's gonna cost us about $500 a month to keep our stream from falling out or messing up. That's $6,000 a year. That's a lot of money. But I'm sorry that we've had that connection issue and I just want you to know, you matter just as much as, as we matter in here. And, and we love you and we thank you that you're on, online. And here's the thing, church, so many people are watching online and then coming in here. Some of you are probably testimonies of that, just to see what we're like. They, they, they say this nowadays in church, online is the new front lobby of the church. It's the new greeter team, it's a new usher team. It's, that's what it is. Culture has changed right before us, church. And here's the thing, and, and so thank you. We're praying, we're working on that. We're working on fixing that and, and investing in that program to help us. And church, if you wanna help us, you can do that. We appreciate it, because we care about everyone joining online as well. Amen? Amen. So here's the thing. These two pastors said, we can either sit around and reflect on the days that church used to be, or we can roll up our sleeves and do something about it. See, Jesus could have said, wow, look at all these people hurting. Or he could go, let me do something about it. See, compassion leads us to do something about the hurt in our world, and we're seeing it, and we're seeing lostness, and we're seeing people who need, guide, need guidance, and we are God's greatest reach. Outside of Jesus, we are God's greatest reach. So I have an announcement for you. Calvary is now a missionary church. We've always been a missionary church, but I'm making sure we understand we are a missionary church. We are living, yes. We need, a, we need to have a paradigm shift in how we view church because we're living in a nation who's not serving God, not wanting to be in church, so to say. But I got some good statistics to share with you because it's not all bad news. But here's the thing, 
church has changed the way it looks and how it functions. And we are a missionary church because of the lostness and the godlessness in our nation. We have to look at ourselves as we're the missionaries now. You understand what I'm saying? Like we used to send money, we still send a lot of money to missionaries. We send money to missionaries in other countries. They're sending missionaries to us. They're sending missionaries to DC this past week to change our community. Wow, we're the missionaries, you're the missionary. That's how lost our nation is. And God is calling you to rise up and be a missionary. And every time you give to this church, every time you serve in this church, every time you leave this church, you're part of our missionary effort in Dover, Delaware and beyond. Because God loves every single one of you and he loves every single person who's watching and he loves all those who aren't watching and all those who aren't here. God's love is so big. He gave his son, Jesus Christ, that you'd be changed forever. And he's not done changing lives. There's more people to gather to bring from the harvest fields into his house, his family, the family of God. Here's what happened. The American church planned for years for the lost to flock to church. That was never God's plan. God's plan was that the church would go to the flock that the church will go out into the fields and bring in the harvest. Praise God. It would be like if Peter and Jesus went fishing, like he did in Luke 5. Jesus didn't say, all right, get in your boat. We're going to stay on the shore and catch fish from here. No, he said, get in the boat. They pushed the boat out further, deeper into the water, and that's when they gathered more fish. Jesus uses that story and that analogy to say that if we're going to reach people, we got to go where they are. And now you're a fisher of men, not a fisher of fish, is what he told Peter. I'm, I'm giving the Ryan version, but that's the basic of the message. That Peter had to be brave and push that boat out with Jesus in the boat with him. And praise God, when you leave today, Jesus is with you. You're not alone. You're not alone. When you're building that bridge, you're not alone. I want to show you a picture of the difference between a stationary church and a missionary church like Calvary. Check out this picture of this bridge. Thank God for a tech team who knows what they're doing and put this together for me. Captured it well. The church is on this side of the bridge. The world is over there. God knew that a building wasn't gonna crawl or walk across that bridge. God knew that when he said, I'm Lord of the harvest, I'm going to send out workers. We would leave the church and cross into the darkness of our world, the hopelessness of our world, and we would reach the lost. Because the church is man, it's human, it's people. You wouldn't see me put this building on tractor trailers and try to drag it to a neighborhood to reach it. We do. And when we go over there, we're going to find something out that's really cool. Jesus is already there because that's where his harvest is and he's the Lord of the harvest and he's across the bridge going, come over here. I love that you're worshiping me, but come over here. I'm going to say something strong and I'm just saying this just to teach everyone. Too much in America, Christians have worshiped worship. Do you know what I'm saying? Too often we have worshiped worship. We worship Unfortunately, we, we love to do our worship services, but we don't realize that when we leave and go be a light in our community, that's also worshiping God because it's obeying the call to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded them, and I will be with you until the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. That's what he's called us to do. And I'm not bagging on the church and bashing the church because worship is so key to us aligning with God's spirit, aligning with him, and then going out and showing God to the world. That is number one. So check out this next picture. This is a beautiful picture of people worshiping God. I just picked a, I, didn't, I wasn't trying to pick on anyone's church. I just picked one I found online real quick, gave it to the tech team. That's a beautiful picture of worship. But I wouldn't call that revival yet. We often in Christianity and Christendom, for years, we call that revival. There's a revival taking place in our church. There's a revival taking place in our church. Can I tell you something about the difference between a missionary church and a stationary church? 
is a revival is when the church leaves and goes and reaches the lost. What does a revival look like? A revival looks like neighbors loving their neighbors for Christ. A revival looks like a young adult group going out and witnessing and praying for people. A revival is when you open up your home for a Bible study and you invite the lost to come in. Revival is when we go out of here and we share what we've learned over the years, over and over again, where we make it a priority to go into the harvest field. That's what it is. And here's the thing. You may not, and I get this every time I preach on this, I get this resistance in my heart and in my spirit that we feel. The inadequacy that I'm not able to do this. And I'm gonna tell you in a minute when we do this, this commissioning for all of us, but God's not asking you to have your five-year plan right away. He's not asking you to have a three-year plan on how to reach someone. Do you know what he wants you to do? He just wants you to say, yes, I'll go. That's it. When I was 12, I just said, God got a hold of me one day at youth group. And I just said, yes. I didn't, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I was too young. I couldn't even picture me being here today. I didn't know what I was gonna do at Polytech. I didn't know what I was gonna do in, in, in uh, Valley Fort. I went to uh, Polytech High School. I didn't know what I was gonna do with my friends. I didn't know how I was gonna reach them. I just said yes. And then I found out that as I followed Jesus, he's with me to show me how to do it. He's gonna empower you through the Holy Spirit to give you the words to say. And, the, and, and by the way, he said, love your neighbor. That's doable. That's doable. So what does a revival look like? A revival is you and me on mission, building bridges, using our lives, our homes, our giftings and passions to be a light that shines, to Jesus, shines Jesus to all who would accept our invitation. Here's the reality. Here's, here's a, some good news. You ready? Because we heard the reality. Here's some good news. Rick Richardson wrote a book called um, You Found Me. And he surveyed 2,000 unchurched people in America in 2019. These are, these are so encouraging, these statistics. Because I think a lot of times we just hear the doom and gloom. The church is, you know, dying. People are leaving the church. You know, no one wants to come to Christ, whatever. Check this out. 2019, 42% said church is good for the community. Unchurched people. 42%. You're probably thinking, well, so what does the other 58% think? Well, guess what? 6% say the church is not good for the community. So 42% are saying that the church, unchurched people are saying the church is good for the community. Only 6% say it's not good. That doesn't sound like a lot of people are really bothered by us. They actually want the church. You ready for this? Here's another statistic. 80% said it's okay to talk about your faith with them if it's important to you. 80%. That's four out of five people. They're willing to hear about your faith if it's important to you. But we've always been told, don't do it. It's bad talk around the dinner table. And we know the other one is bad to talk about. <laughs> lastly, 55% said they would attend church if invited in a proper way. In other words, probably not pressuring not bothering them, but just friendly invitation. Pick, you know, go with them, sit with them. 55% of 2,000 unchurched people are saying, I'm willing to come if you invite me right, the right way. I'm willing to come with you. Where, where, have, where has this research been? Why have we been told that no one wants to come here? Why have we been told that no one wants to talk about Jesus? And now even more, it's, it's the statistics I'm sure are better. People want to break from what's going on in this world and they want to talk about some hope. You hear what I'm saying? So what is it going to take? I'm going to give you four things really fast because we're going to, I'm going to send you out and, and I just want to empower you through the Holy Spirit, not me, but by the Holy Spirit. If you would say yes today, if you'd be willing to say yes, God's going to use you. I just know that from my own life and everyone else I talk to and from the word of God. What is it going to take? to be missionary, a missionary church, to build bridges into our community. Number one is we gotta put our faith in God, not ourself. This is God's harvest. This is God's field. It's not ours. Put your faith in God. He's already there. Number two, it's gonna take time. This isn't gonna be a quick, easy fix, church. It's gonna take patience and commitment. It's gonna take building relationship and that takes time with our neighbors and our coworkers and our community. 
It's not about a quick invitation to believe in Jesus. It's about showing them the love of Jesus, helping them see Jesus in your life. And if they're ready, go ahead and invite them to church. Invite them to a Bible study at your house or a restaurant, whatever's safe for you. But it's time. It's going to take time to do this. It doesn't change overnight. Thirdly is compassion. You know what, who my heart is breaking for right now after hearing some things in the past week or two? Teachers. Teachers are struggling. They're, you see, you're here, right there. Teachers are going through it. Eight hours on Zoom. I've been three hours on Zoom and I'm exhausted. There's actually something called Zoom fatigue where you can't, you don't want to be on any longer. You're tired. And there's teachers teaching on Zoom and teaching in person. There's medical professionals who are tired. There's people, in other words, not just them, there's so many people who are tired and need encouragement and need kindness and love. Let's serve those people in our community, church. Let's, let's keep our eyes open to see those people. Praise God. That's compassion. Put yourself in their shoes. Practice empathy. What would you want if you were going through it? Encourage them. Give them gift cards for some coffee or something on the way into work. Or just send them a note saying, I'm praying for you today. You are working so hard for these kids. Administrators, all of them. Parents who are having to work from home and be teachers too. Wow. I had a taste of that. I did not like it. And lastly, courage and perseverance. Because you're going to face resistance. You're going to face resistance. We'll face rejection. We'll get tired. We'll feel like it's all in vain. But I want to connect a dot that's so powerful today. Pastor Kuhn said this scripture last week. He said this, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. In other words, keep doing the will of God. Let nothing move you. I know it's going to be hard. It's going to be tired. You're going to face rejection. Don't let it move you. Stand your ground. Always give yourselves fully, fully to the work of the Lord, whether it's at your work, your school, students, wherever it is that you're at. Give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It's not a waste. But here's what's crazy. You ready for this? Matthew 9 says the laborers are few. This one says, your labor won't be in vain. That's encouraging to me that if I start laboring, it won't be in vain. That's one excuse out the window that if I do something, God's going to do something. He's going to magnify it. He's going to amplify my efforts. He's going to do something powerful through it. It won't be in vain, church, to love a neighbor. You never know. You never know how years later someone gives their life to Christ. And guess what? There's going to be people that give their life to Christ. You'll never even know about it until heaven because they went and moved on to a whole other state. I just got done reading a story from Craig Keener who wrote a commentary who said two men evangelized him on the corner of a street and he gave his life to Christ. He was an atheist against God. He went home and gave his life to Jesus and he's been writing commentaries for churches. In other words, deep, big books on how to understand the Bible. He's a doctor, a professor, a theologian, and two people on the corner of the street led him to the Lord, and he doesn't know how to find them, so he wrote a public post this past week to say thank you for loving me on the corner of that street because you never know what's going to happen when you throw out a seed, and God gets a hold of it and plants it deep in someone's heart. Praise the Lord. Be encouraged. Your work is not in vain. Would you stand with me? Would you stand with me here? Because we're going to sing together. And it sounds like because we got rain, we can spend a little bit more time in here because you don't want to get drenched. We'll pray that it goes away after this. I want to commission you today. And after I'm done, I want to greet our guests. We've had a lot of guests coming in. And I want to go out to the, uh, to the middle of the lobby and get set up to greet you if you would like to, if you want to take a moment to do that. I won't keep you long. But Dorothy's going to come up and give us some news about this month of outreach we have and a lot of things going on, and we're going to need your help to do this. Um, So I want to do that after we worship together and pray and commit ourselves to the mission. And I don't ever do this to single you out, or I'm not looking for hands not to be raised. But would you just say today that I'll, I'll at least say yes to God?
you know, I'll go out into the field. I don't got it all figured out. I don't know how it's going to look yet, but I'm willing to follow the Lord of the harvest. And I'm commissioning, I'm going to be commissioned by God today to go and be sent forth as a laborer. And if that's you, would you just raise a hand right now and say, me, my family, we're going to go into this world. Because here's what's going to happen. I believe the Holy Spirit is going to equip you and be with you for this journey. He's going to do this with you. You are not alone, church. You are not alone. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing a song called Spirit Breakout. It's about revival, because we believe the Holy Spirit's going to go with us. We need a revival in this community. And after that song, Dorothy will come up. So I just want to be clear on that. So let's pray together. Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord of the harvest, we recognize your harvest is ready and plenty. Help us to see what you see. We are committing ourselves and our families to be sent forth into the harvest fields in your power, not our own. Give us courage and faith to be in our community, showing and sharing the love of Jesus. Give us the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. We invite you into our our lives right now. We want your Holy Spirit to cleanse us, to heal us, so we can be healed people who go heal people, Lord. We ask for your Holy Spirit to, to hurt, to heal the hurt that we're dealing with, Lord. God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to give us creativity and ideas and acts of kindness to love and show compassion. Lord, give us endurance and perseverance as we face resistance, Lord. May it not be, uh, may it not discourage us, God. We say that we will stay, stand firm and stay steadfast in you. We will stand firm and not be moved by what we face because we know, Lord, that our labor is not in vain. So lead and use us to bridge the loss to Jesus. And ultimately, we trust in you, Jesus. We trust in you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.